بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد To continue with our series on Ibn Ata'illah's Book of Wisdoms, the Hikam, we are on page 199. We are looking at, first today we'll look at Hikmah number 98. Now this Hikmah number 98, we discussed 97 last time in the last session, uh, very, uh, in a very detailed way. And this actually fits in with that. But last time I didn't read it because... We may have gone over time. So I'm just going to remind us of that one by reading this and then Shaykh Abdullah's Gangohi, uh, his commentary, and then we'll move on to the new one for today. So it's on page 199, Hikmah number 98. Ibn Ata'illah says, An'ama alayka awwalan bil ijad wa thaniyan bitawal al imdad, which was very similar to what he had said earlier. نعمتان ما خرج مودون موجود عنهما ولا بد لكل مكون منهما نعمة الإيجاد ونعمة الإمداد. That one last time which we discussed in detail had said that there are two graces from which no being can be separated and that are inevitable for every creature. Allah subhanahu wa taala gives two things to every single created being. Those are the grace of existence that He brings us into existence and number two the grace of sustenance that He continues to provide for us. So here, he, in this one, he's actually now directing it right at the human being and he's saying, forget all of other creation, Allah gives that, but he bestowed his grace upon you. First, through giving you being, and second, through uninterrupted sustenance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has graced you by bringing you into the world so that now you exist here and you did not exist before. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to continue to breathe and feed and eat and sustain yourself. Last time we discussed how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set the whole thing in motion, facilitated everything from the early times to this time, how He created us, the human being. Now if we zoom in a bit more in detail, and you look at just the human skin. The human skin is maybe, I don't know, maybe a millimeter or so in thickness, just over a millimeter in thickness. Now, I know I'm sitting in front of a doctor here, but there are three, our skin is made up of three layers, right? The top one is called the, I'm going to test you now. So, essentially the top one is the epidermis, and the middle one, which is the substantial portion, is the dermis, right? That's why you call those who deal with skins, you call them the dermatologists, right? So they're dealing with the derma. So, what's really interesting is that the top, there's three levels, three layers. The top layer is literally 0.1 of a, maybe 0.1 of a millimeter. That's the top layer. That's all it is. It's just, if you see a cross section, it's just literally the top layer. The middle layer is the one that has the, the blood cells, the white blood cells and so on and so forth. That's the one in which is the root of the hair that we may have hair follicles, it actually goes into that middle section, which is the thickest section uh, of our skin. I mean, how thick is the skin? You know, the flesh is beneath it. Now, what's really interesting is that the top part of the skin is made up of these cells. And new cells, they generate at the bottom of that 0.1 millimeter of skin. That, that top layer of skin is made up of different material to the middle dermis layer. Right, which is more, you can say, more steady, that has uh, various different things happening in there. Um, but the top layer is the one that's constantly being regenerated. It takes uh, several weeks for it to become fresh. So essentially, our top part of the skin is actually fresh skin. Right? So several weeks ago, that which started off at the bottom of that 0.1 millimeter of layer, moves its way up. It's small, small cells, they just move up, really micro uh, you know, small, very nano cells or whatever you call them, and they move up. And the top part is what sheds. That's what you call skin shedding. It happens to everybody. But that's why this skin never goes old. Right? That's why we constantly have fresh skin. 
It's an amazing system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just the skin amazed me, like just the skin. Then how the heart works, the other complicated organs work. So the skin is, we think, we just see it as when somebody cuts through it, we see it as three, we don't see it as three layers, just as one layer, just one piece, like just a millimeter or so. But it's so complicated. And the contents of the middle uh, layer of that is amazing. Right? But the top layer has been allowed to constantly move. That's why, for example, if they, when they're doing tattooing, they, they can't just put it on the top layer because that would just disappear. So they have to actually get it into the middle layer. Likewise, henna, the, that pigmentation gets in. I guess henna would be on the top layer. That's why it disappears within. Why does henna disappear? Well, number one, you get washed off. But if you di even if you didn't, it'd probably just regenerate and it'd be... It'd be gone. That's why tattoos last longer because they get it down into the middle layer, the dermis, which is haram. It's not allowed to do that because that's more permanent. Amazing, just amazing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for every single part of the body to allow that to continue. So, anyway, this is what Shaykh Abdullah Gangohi says in explanation of it. He says, In the previous aphorism, mention was made of the bounties of creation and assistance common to all created. Objects. Allah gives sustenance and creation to every object. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, now addresses man in particular. In fact, the address is directed to the believer whose attention is drawn to his earlier state of pure non-existence, where when we did not exist, from which Allah Most High conferred on him the grace of being existent. The believer should thus understand that he is wholly dependent on Allah Most High for his existence. Dependence is, therefore, man's natural and inherent attribute, which he should never forget. So, somebody might think that, okay, Allah has brought me into existence. Like, for example, somebody creates um, Bosch. They make a washing machine. Bosch doesn't have to keep coming and operating the washing machine. You can do it yourself. It runs on its own now, right? So, the manufacturer doesn't have to have any... Nowadays, actually, manufacturers, they want to start controlling things. Right? They want to start being God. So that's why there's a smart controlling where they want to control everything. Upgrade it for you directly. You need to be connected and so on and so forth. Before, you could buy standalone Microsoft Word. Now, it needs to be online. Even Adobe programs, they want to connect you. you know, they want to be controlling you eventually of everything. Right? I'm not saying there's anything sinister. I'm just saying that that's what it is. But when it comes to the world, so what, what we used to think is that some people think is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates people and then they just function on their own. So that's why he's making it very clear that that was just one part of his grace, that he created you. But number two, yes, he's given you the tools to breathe and sustain yourself, but then he continued to provide all of that. You are still in need of him. You are still in as much need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you were before he created you. Yes, visibly there's a difference. Before we created us, we were nothing. What were we going to do anyway? Now we feel we can do something at least. We feel independence. We feel control. Right? But at the end of the day, it's still the same. Because Allah could switch off life immediately. In an instance. It doesn't need an excuse for it. So that's why he's saying, dependence is therefore man's natural and inherent attribute, which he should never forget. We are innately, essentially, intrinsically, by our very nature, we are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether we realize it or not. Secondly, with every breath and moment, Allah Most High ensures that man receives his continuous favors, meaning Allah's continuous favors, necessary for his physical and spiritual existence. Food, garments, air, and a variety of other preparations have already been made and are being continuously created for man's physical existence and survival. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us he knew that we were going to be dressed, so he allowed various things to be found in the earth that allows us to produce fabric from that. Whether that be the cotton that grows, whether that be the cotton that grows from the ground, or nowadays, whether that be the polyester and other materials that come from the oils that come out of the ground, or whether that is the bamboo fiber, or whatever other fiber that people try to figure out. For man's spiritual existence, though Allah Most High constantly sends his aid in an uninterrupted flow, 
without so we as muslims because he's addressing believers and seekers and people who want to be close to allah just like allah created us just like allah sustains us with the food and everything else in the air we also need him for our spiritual sustenance of the heart for us to be able to continue to remember him to stay in touch to stay connected to worship to show our devotion we also need his help for that just because he's obligated us to do those things it doesn't mean we become independent in doing those things we still need his help for that just like we need his help for our food and breath and air and everything else so without the spiritual aid of Allah, the believer will go astray. We are literally being stopped from going astray. We're being prevented by Allah continuing to send the power through for us to continue to believe. If Allah doesn't want us to for some reason, He will just stop. He doesn't even have to push us to the other side. We will get just naturally, we'll just deviate to that side. May Allah protect us. Thus, it has been observed that when Allah Most High terminates His aid from certain people, they fall headlong into deviation. With some people, you actually clearly see it. They were so decent. There's a guy who called me today. He married a convert. She was praying, hijab, everything. And he says, after a few years, she just stopped doing all of that. What should I do? I don't want to leave her. I said, it's not about what you want to do now, right? It could be that Allah has made a decision for you. You should just straight out ask her, are you still a believer? Because if she's not a Muslim, and she's no longer a Christian or Jew either, then your nikah doesn't stand. Your marriage doesn't stand anymore. Whatever, whatever you want, whatever anybody says, just that much has to be there. Right? Since it is not possible for one to be independent from the Lord for even a second, then why do we feign independence? Why do we pretend to be independent? Why this self-esteem? Why this claim of excellence? How can these claims be correct, he asks? You should become a slave to Allah, keeping in mind one's origin and refrain from making boastful claims. So that just puts more in perspective what we read last time. Now let us move on to wisdom number 101, which is on page 200. This is a, a different idea to what we read last time. Ibn Ata'illah says, مَتَىٰ أَوْحَشَكَ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَفْتَحَ لَكَ بَابَ الْأُنْسِ بِهِ مَتَىٰ أَوْحَشَكَ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَفْتَحَ لَكَ بَابَ الْأُنْسِ بِهِ Now listen. But I'll just give you a prelude. What this is, is that this is sometimes an experience that some people have. That they suddenly just feel like they don't want to talk to people. They no longer like to hang out. Now, there's lots of people whom that might happen to because they're depressed. Because there's something going on in their life. So they withdraw. People could withdraw for many, many reasons. You get this question, oh, so-and-so is withdrawn, they used to be very good with us, but now they don't want to come out of the house or whatever. It could be psychological problems. Some people have mental problems, that's why they don't, they stop. Some people have paranoia about certain things. Or some people are just begrieved, you know, they're just aggrieved. They have some huge sorrow or sadness. It could be many, many reasons why people withdraw away from others. And some people are just naturally like that. Now, none of that is praiseworthy necessarily. It might save you in a way, but it may be unhealthy. Because uh, some people when they're alone, uh, and that's why a lot of people have suffered during the COVID, because they were forced to withdraw. They couldn't go, they were, they were paranoid, they didn't want to take a risk. Some people didn't want to take a risk, some people were very law-abiding, and uh, they didn't want to go by, forget the letter of the law, I mean, they didn't even want to go to the spirit of the law, so they didn't want to make any and there was others who are not going by the letter of the law but going by the spirit of the law and some people just flouting the law but these people didn't and they were having mental breakdowns they were having some serious issues so there could be many reasons why people withdraw so this is not talking about all forms of withdrawal from people this is not talk about all forms of estrangement that i don't want to be with people anymore because there could be many reasons some reasons are healthy but a lot of reasons are not healthy humans are 
creatures, we need people. Allah always created us from other human beings. We always have parents. You can never, you see, with anybody else, with friends, you can replace them. With anything you own, you can replace it. Even with a spouse, you can replace, right? Not to diminish the position of a spouse, but you can. But you cannot replace parents. You cannot replace brothers and sisters. It just cannot happen. That's a test from Allah. If they're bad brothers and sisters, you think they are, or maybe they are, you know, because sometimes you think they are, but they're not. And sometimes they are bad. Sometimes the parents are unreasonable. Sometimes they could be oppressors. Sometimes they could be just wrong. But I, rem I recently I, I saw one son telling his father that, look, Allah has put us into this relationship, right? Regardless of how harsh you are, I'm going to have to bear it. I may, I may get upset, but I have to just forget about it at the end of the day and just be back. That's the best policy that you can have with, your, with people like that. There's no other way about it. Allah has tested you with them. Allah has tested you with them. So, yes, I know what you say to me is going to be very bitter and sometimes I'm going to be very upset. But in order for that relationship to maintain, I need to be wise enough now to just say, okay, right, I'm going to, I've gotten angry, but he's my father at the end of the day. He's my, she's my mother at the end of the day. So I need to clear my heart. With your kin, that's what Allah wants us to do, to the best of your ability. Of course, unless they are actively harming you, then you can obviously protect yourself. That's a different issue. But I'm saying that when it's just tough to deal with them. Now, with anybody else, you don't have to stay friends with them. You can just find another friend if they're tough, if they're complicated people. But with your parents, with your children, you just can't do that. If you're going to treat your own children and your own parents like other strangers that, hey, I can just stop talking to them, that's absolutely ridiculous. I know some people who do this. They don't speak to their brothers and sisters, you know, for whatever reason. They break ties with them. Now, I've mentioned this before, so I don't want to reiterate everything and repeat everything, but just... Maintaining ties doesn't mean that you must always be with them and have these huge meetings with them and feed food with them and everything. It means that at least you're on some kind of talking terms. At least you're there for them. It doesn't mean that you have to then always be with them because some people just to be with them for too long always ends up in a problem. So you can keep some space. But just remember that this should be the policy with your parents and children. That at the end of the day, you just have to let it be and go back because that's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us there. So anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us from people. He never, there's nobody created even, okay, it's only Adam alayhi was created from nothing, from just soil. But after him, everybody's been created from another human being. And there's a reason for that because we are social beings. So people withdraw from others for different reasons. Now he's mentioning one healthy reason. Right? Which is, he's saying that when Allah alienates you from His creatures, when you feel alienated, you don't feel like being with people. When do you know that that's the right reason or the right feeling that you don't need to do anything about and you should enjoy it rather than protest against it? When is the right time to feel alienated? Then know that He wants to open up for you the door of intimacy with Him. If that's what's happening to you, then you should celebrate your estrangement from people. Like you feel like doing more prayer. You feel like doing more dhikr. You feel like spending your nights with Allah, praying in, in night vigil. Then know that your estrangement from people is for the right reason Allah wants you to be close to Him. But if your estrangement from people is just making you miserable, you're not even praying to Allah, nothing, then that's for the wrong reason. Then it's a psychological, mental problem or something else that's happened. So now let's understand this. So essentially what the author is telling us is that generally, and you'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll summarize it quickly for you. What happens is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to draw somebody very close, then it's almost like he forces you into a i'tikaf. He forces a person into a retreat with him. That means that you could be in your house or even living among people, but you don't feel like interacting as much. And this is the sunnatullah. This is Allah's way in this world. This is how he does it. 
right? But it's always temporary, remember that. It's never permanent. This is always temporary. It's a temporary retreat. Retreats are always temporary. If a retreat becomes permanent, it's no longer a retreat. It's your, no, it's your style, right? But Allah has made us social beings. So Allah doesn't want us to exclude ourselves for too long or forever, right? Generally speaking, people exclude. And I've read this in the lives of the pious many times. Right, so when you hear about them, they, many of them have gone through this kind of a feeling where they just didn't feel like being with anybody. And they were just doing dhikr and so on and so forth. And then after that, they came back out much more powerful than they were before because now they were connected in a very strong way. This is the kind of khalwa that they speak about. So this is what he says. He says, this is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in among his creation that when he wants a person to start really enjoying the remembrance of Allah, like really enjoying that remembrance. And Allah wants to grant him his awareness and his ma'rifah and his knowledge. Then he makes him feel estranged. He doesn't feel right when he's among people. He, Allah then engages this person in the service of Allah. And he inspires him to do more dhikr. It becomes easier to do dhikr. It just becomes easy. You just want to do that. Until with that abundance, um, abundance of remembrance, the heart becomes filled with light. Then the person gets other gifts from Allah where they witness certain realities. They feel the sweetness of Iman, right? It's certain experiences that happen, right? Thereafter that, once a person is complete in that regard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then returns them back to the human beings, back to social life. They feel like they can engage with others again. Now, what they will do is they will only take the best from people. They will never be such that they will allow people to take them over and engage them in the wrong things. You'll be very solid after this. Where before you were struggling with your phone, these are constant complaints that just don't have enough time because I spend so much time on my phone. Well, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does it this way for us, we'll get back on the phone. But it'll be used for the right reasons. And it will be used very in a particular way. He gives an example. It's a really, really relevant example, but you have to make it work. He says, you know when you have, I guess you could use it as a barbecue, right? He gives the example of a little lamp. You know, you have those lamps with oil and they have a little wick sticking out. So what happens, you have to first get that to burn. When it starts burning, initially you have to protect it from air, from wind. Otherwise, it'll just get put off. So for example, a barbecue. When you try to light a barbecue, you need to make sure that there's not too much wind. Because if there is, then it'll just keep taking that flame off because before it actually catches the whole coal. Right, you're trying to do a bakhur coal or, you know, whatever, barbecue, right? You have to first protect it. Now... After that, once, mashallah, it's lit and all the coal are lit, then the wind actually just, mashallah, gives it more fire. It's not going to turn it off. And the more wind that happens, even if you've got these embers which are dying out, how do they rekindle them? By, by giving them more air. So that air which was actually harmful for it first, now becomes beneficial afterwards. So it's the same kind of idea he's saying, that initially you're going to have to protect it from the wind. Right? So that's why you take it to an enclosed space and everything. But as soon as it, the light is kindled, and as, as soon as it becomes stronger, then after that, it gets a bit of wind, it gets even stronger. Likewise is the human being as well. Initially, you need to start protecting it from the wrong influences, whether that be in person from human being or whether that be through their messages and everything else through Facebook and other things like that. So that's why if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, He will help you to disengage with all of this for a while. Then uh, when your heart is strong enough, you can come back in and then these things will be used for a benefit only. So if you ever feel like that, He's saying, right? Now remember, as I said again, this is not everybody because you could retreat for other reasons, for mental health reasons or, or you're forced to retreat in the in the pandemic, 
But if you're retreating and you're finding that you're actually getting closer to Allah, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that for you. That's why the Prophet sallallahu if you look at it as well, it says that before he became a Prophet, حُبِّبَ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَاء First, being alone and solitude was made beloved to him. He started enjoying his solitude. So that's why he would take, uh, or for, for some time, before he received this first revelation, he would take a bit of provisions, a packed lunch or whatever you want to call it, some supplies. And he would go up and retreat in this cave of Hira. And that's exactly what happened. You need that first to create the heart, to create the right place for then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shine the lights and to give that experience. It's exactly what happened with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Why? First, you need to go into a retreat to remove from the heart all of these distractions. That's what it really is. It's to remove from the heart distractions and everything else that will generally attract it away. So then it becomes prepared to take in a new content. And that new content is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when it becomes cleansed of all of the soil and the filth and the dirt and the distractions and the other engagements, then it will be filled with the lights. Then the, 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 the sun of awareness, the suns of awareness, the lights of awareness will come out. Much what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with all of his awliya and his asfiya, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa down to, as I said, all the stories that I've read, generally uh, you're going to have somebody doing that. In fact, what they do in many uh, Sufi ways, in the good Sufi ways, that they'll actually uh, put you into a khalwa. So if they'll force this almost upon you, get you to go into a khalwa where you go into an etikaf. You know, so there's a 10-day etikaf, but then there's a 40-day etikaf. There could be a two-month etikaf. Generally, 40 days is good enough for any kind of mature. Human beings need 40 days of something to kick a habit, for example. 40 days to become habituated to something else. Do something in 40 days. You can probably do it for the rest of your life. Right? As long as you don't go without it for 10, 15 days or something. So that, that's what it is. 40 days is a kind of maturity period. So uh, in, in Tanaba, on Hakim al used to do that. He used to have people come in. He had this special place out there in the woods, right? A building. They would be given, I think, food twice a day or something. And they would just have to sit there and do dhikr. It was like a khanka. Right? Like a retreat. It's exactly like a retreat. Today, you pay very, you know, you pay a huge amount of sums to go and do this. Those days, the sheikh did it for you for free, right? So essentially, that was it. It was to force you into that khalwa and then to detox. That's essentially what's happening here. So this is Allah's sunnah with the awliya and asfiya, that they, he gets them to flee the people. Now, if they flee themselves and they feel this, alhamdulillah, but that's why I said some sheikhs, they f- uh, try to compel this state upon you if, you're, if, you're re- if they think you're ready for it. So until, yes, then after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets them go out to people and they just shine, mashallah. And then they help others and people benefit from them as well. That's why there's a poet who says, Tahya bikum kullu ardin tanziluna biha ka'annakum fi biqa'il ardi amtaru wa tashtahil aynu fikum mandharan hasana ka'annakum fi uyunin nasi azharu wa nurukum yahtadi sari bi ru'yatihi ka'annakum fi dhalami layli aqmaru. The whole land will then become enlivened by you. Any land that you a light upon wherever you go to stay whichever area you're in that will become lit by you it is as if you are the rain that brings a lot of sustenance for for those you're the one who will bring the rain and shower down for those hearts that need it and lots of eyes will then be pleased to see you and they will uh, it is as if you become like, like a flower now among people. So you'll be a breath of, breath of fresh air. Whereas people would avoid you first or consider you to be boisterous or something else and mean. Now you'll come back as a source of, uh, as a source of glad tiding for them, as a source of pleasantness. And your light will be the one that anybody who wants to traverse the path will be able to use your light to traverse the path. And it's the, as though you now become the moon's you now become the moon in the dark nights. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of them. May Allah make us of them. May Allah make us of them. 
So that's, that's it. That's uh, what he's trying to say by this. So Sheikh Abdullah Gangohi says on this one, he says, O traveler, if your heart cannot find solace with anyone except in the invocation of Allah, you just don't like people anymore, right? It's temporary. As long as you're finding solace in the invocation of Allah and you become terrified of creatures, then understand this state to indicate Allah's, in t Allah's willing intimacy for you and that He will keep you aloof from all things besides Him. On the other hand, if your heart just derives comfort from creatures and you become bored and terrified of solitude and invocation, then understand that this condition is a great loss and misfortune for you. This is what a lot of us are struggling with, where we just enjoy with people rather than spending 10 minutes uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah make it easy for us. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ya dhal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Ya arham al-rahimin, ya dhal jalali wal ikram, ya akram al-akramin, ya khayr al-mas'ulin wa ya khayr al-mu'teen. Wa ya ma'din al-joodi wal karam, akrimna. أكرمنا أكرمنا إرحمنا إرحمنا برحمة تغننا بها عمن سواك اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا وهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اغفر لأمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات المؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات يا الله have mercy upon us يا الله forgive us يا الله purify us يا الله protect us Ya Allah, enable us to do the right thing. We thank you for our existence. We thank you for the gift of sustenance. Oh Allah, you have given us so much more than so many others. Oh Allah, do not allow us to use what you have given us to disobey you. Oh Allah, protect us from distractions. Oh Allah, call us to you in the right way. Oh Allah, allow us to remember you and to find comfort in your remembrance and to enjoy your remembrance. O oh Allah, grant us the tawfiq to remember you. Grant us the ability to thank you. Grant us the ability to be, to be correct human beings, to be the way you want us to be, the way you want, the way your friends are, the way your awliya are. O oh Allah, accept us from among them as well. O oh Allah, we don't have much to show. We don't have much to offer. But, O oh Allah, with your assistance, it can only happen with your assistance. O oh Allah, we are only sitting here and discussing these things because you have allowed us to be here. We could have been doing so many other things. But, O oh Allah, we are here because you've allowed us to be here. O oh Allah, now that you've allowed us to be here, O oh Allah, allow us to be now accepted. O oh Allah, let it not stop here. But, O oh Allah, facilitate the other steps for us to be close to you. O oh Allah, make this easy for us. We struggle, we fail, we fall. O oh Allah, but do not let us be defeated. Do not let us stay down. Always allow us to stand back up and allow us to be steadfast. Allow us to be strong. Allow us to gain your love in our hearts. To love you and for you to love us. O oh Allah, protect us and protect our parents and our all our relatives, and especially our children and our progeny until the Day of Judgment, who you've made us responsible for, allow us to fulfill that responsibility. Allow us to be forces of good in this world. Allow us to leave a legacy. O oh Allah, remove this pandemic. O oh Allah, remove this pandemic. O oh Allah, protect us. O oh Allah, protect us. Those who have passed on, grant them a high status. Those who are suffering today, remove their suffering. O oh Allah, those who are subjugated, remove their subjugation. O oh Allah, assist us and protect us and bless us. And O oh Allah, we are abundantly thankful to you. And grant us the tawfiq to always be grateful to you and to constantly be uh, grateful to you for everything. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifuna wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bi rahmatika ya arham al rahimin Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.